of water, earth, and sky. Heavens are your tabernacle. Glory to the Lord on high. God of wonders beyond our galaxy. You are holy. declares your majesty you are holy holy lord of heaven and earth lord of heaven and earth lord of heaven and earth lord of heaven and beyond our galaxy. You are holy, holy. The universe declares your majesty. You are holy, holy. God of wonders, God of wonders beyond our galaxy. You are holy, holy. The universe, the universe declares your majesty. You are holy, holy. Lord of heaven and earth. Lord of heaven and earth. Lord Good morning, church family. To see you this uh, April morning, two weeks to Easter. Hope you guys are getting excited about Easter and not just because of the good food that a lot of us have on Easter. Just uh, want to touch on some of the announcements that uh, we have for this morning. Uh, there are eight cards out in the Welcome Center spread out on the tables that are out there. And those cards are for the eight college students that are going to be receiving care packages late this week. So even if you didn't have the opportunity, because they all got snapped up, to be able to um, get you know, items for the care packages, take some time on your way out today after the service and just throw your signature on a card, maybe or just something along those lines that will be uh, another way to encourage our college students. There's some sign-ups out there in the men's, or in the Welcome Center, not in the men's Welcome Center, just in the Welcome Center, but the first two events are uh, for the guys. So guys, this is the last day to sign up for two things. One is this coming Saturday, the, uh, the 9th at 8.30. We're having a breakfast here at the church. It's our second men's breakfast. Um, the other Don Fisher is uh, the better looking one. Uh, he is the, uh, he's going to be our speaker and we'll have a little bit of worship as well um, that morning. We just need your name on there so we can plan for the right amount of food. So this is the last day to sign up for that, guys. And also, men, it's also the last day to sign up on the 16th of April. We're trying to put together a group to shoot up to the Boston Project.
So um, on the 16th, we're trying to get a small group together to go from 9 to 2 up to visit our missionaries in Dorchester, the Boston Project. And the work is just going to uh, mostly involve building some raised uh, garden beds. Uh, you guys may have seen those before. And so, uh, and repairing at least one as well. So that's what's going to be going on up there for that. Today is the last day to sign up for that, guys, because in order for it to happen, we actually need people to sign up uh, to go for that. And then, if you are interested in Easter caroling, I know caroling is typically a Christmas thing, but I was trying to think of a way that we might be able to bless some of our shut-ins and some of our widows and possibly even go and visit a nursing home and, and you know, bless them not just at Christmas time when we go caroling like we do every year, but also Easter caroling. So on Palm Sunday afternoon at 4, we're going to leave here from the church, and we're just going to pop over to some local homes and, and sing some Easter songs instead of singing some Christmas songs. We'll have song sheets for you, just like we do at Christmas. But to make sure that we have an in, enough of an interest in that, we need you to sign up today if that's something that you are interested in. Now, ladies, just a few reminders for you. No study this coming Tuesday, but this coming Friday at 7 o'clock is the Women's Friday Fellowship. And then on Saturday, the 16th of April, is the um, women's prayer. So just be aware of that. All right, that is it for the regular announcements. Hey, let's talk a little bit about the Ukraine. We have been letting you know uh, in the midweek email and also on Sunday mornings now for several weeks that we were um, going to be doing something more than just praying for what's going on in the Ukraine. And so, uh, and, and some people say, well, why are we waiting? Why are we waiting? And, and I'll tell you why we're waiting. When things happen, whether it's a hurricane or a wildfire or something like what's going on now uh, with Russia invading Ukraine, when it first happens, everybody wants to give. Everybody, you know, if, if it's after a hurricane, everybody starts trying to figure out a way they can give through the Red Cross or Samaritan's Purse or some other um, decent organization. And what usually happens, what we've heard happens from, from people on the ground, from pastors on the ground, is that everybody gives in the, in the first few weeks, right, and in the first few months. But, but what about four months later? And what about six months later? What about when the rebuilding starts to happen? What very often happens is that the money dries up because everybody's given and it kind of, you know, it leaves everybody's mind um, what it is that's going on. I think there's more people this week who could tell you um, about what happened last Sunday night at the Oscars when Will Smith slapped Chris Rock that can tell you what happened in Ukraine this week. And there's something wrong with that, you know? Uh, something kind of off with that picture. So that's why we wait. And so this morning we're going to do a couple of things. We're going to show you about a five-minute video that will kind of get you caught up to speed on some of the things that are happening with Calvary chapels over in the Ukraine and the bordering nations of Hungary. And I think Poland might be in there as well. If not, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and even, uh, not Mongolia, there's another M. What is it? Moldova. Moldova. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, uh, in Moldova, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that after this short video. Full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Well, late last night, a full-scale attack from all angles made this nightmare a reality. There are reports of explosions and attacks at several major Ukrainian cities. The world watched in horror as the Russian army invaded neighboring Ukraine. The shelling of civilian targets, uh, especially in the east and the south, continues to get worse. Our town was destroyed, our town was bombed and shelled, and there were military jets flying over our houses, and uh, lots of my neighbors died, unfortunately. Those who can escape have fled to nearby countries, more than two million so far. Everybody, 
Street. So I just arrived to Nugati and met these fine gentlemen straight from Ukraine. It took them five, six days to get here. I am from Borodyanka, Ukraine. Um, we have a Calvary Chapel there as well. We used to have Calvary Chapel there. Now the city is destroyed, unfortunately, and I had to flee from Ukraine. As the refugee crisis mounts, Calvary Chapels are joining in the rescue effort. You see the, the church, the, the big C church, just coming together. Everybody's coming together. We are helping inside Ukraine. Uh, there are those inside Ukraine that are kind of like a way stationing. As people are fleeing out, they're feeding them and housing them and, and facilitating. There's also a need for housing. Just all the initial things that people need as they're kind of fleeing their home countries. Um, we spent the day, um, part of it, in a command center where people are coordinating big scale macro excavation efforts. Calvary guys and churches that are all Ukrainian that, I mean, the stories of heroism and courage and boldness, guys that are putting themselves in very difficult spots to get aid to the front lines yeah. and the people. As terrible as this is, the church shines and yeah. believers shine. You know, we run into the difficulties. Next door in Hungary, Calvary Chapel missionaries and churches are welcoming those escaping the violence. We got nine buses into the country to go and rescue a whole bunch of people. We're working mm. with several agencies all together. We're clearing out an orphanage. We're clearing out a cancer ward of a hospital. God had just moved me into a bigger apartment, and now my apartment is kind of a processing place for refugees coming through. And we finished our day meeting with some of the elders of uh, the Budapest Church here, and you know they're deeply involved. They're uh, receiving refugees. You know, refugees are staying in the homes of many other people at church. Um, they come here for a shower or a meal or prayer or to cry and get a hug. And I'm super blessed to be able to do this. to go back home and if I'll ever be able to but I just pray that yeah, I don't know I don't even know what to expect but I know that God has something in plan for our country and I know that our people are strong and fighting Christ is our refuge Christ is our rock he has overcome uh, ultimately he has he has defeated death and I am amazed at how people are united now and how so many people are praying and I know so many people who didn't want to believe in God but now they're saying that that's the only hope they have pray that this war would end and that no more lives would be lost well, we just thank you so much for your prayers God is in the midst of this crazy situation so we just encourage you to keep praying you know, um, God is working. So that gives you just a, a really good sense of an overview of what's happened so far. There's all kinds of things still going on. Um, different countries it's around the only thing the Ukraine are allowing for different things. So, for example, Hungary is taking uh, so far the largest number of refugees. So the Calvary chapels in Hungary are uh, trying to take in as many of those people as they possibly can. You saw the picture of the nine coach buses that they got across the border to just drive, 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 and they uh, emptied out orphanages, they were able to empty out a hospital or two just to get those people back to Hungary. In Poland, what, is, what Poland is allowing is near the border are these humongous empty warehouses. And so what Poland is allowing is for the renting of those warehouses and for those warehouses to become centers for food and for clothing and for medication that's going back into Pol uh, excuse me, that's going back into the Ukraine. And then Moldova, uh, that Dana just uh, mentioned a couple of minutes ago, Moldova is now just starting to see some of the refugees. And so this isn't just about what's going on in the Ukraine, it's about what's going on in these other places as well. I just want to share with you um, 
just uh, something on here that got posted to me a little bit ago. Here we go. Do, 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 do. Um, they were able, I, I don't know how they do some of this stuff other than the Lord. One of the problems is that in some of the hospitals in the Ukraine is, was, is getting medication there. For example, insulin for those who are diabetic. And so uh, somehow the Calvary chapels over there were able to get a refrigeration truck in another country. And uh, let me just read what it says here. Um, uh, we are supplying medications to the three main hospitals in Kiev with official documents to move medications across country borders for this purpose. So today I put in an order for $20,000 in medication and another $11,000 in medication from Serbia that is all being driven to the Ukraine tomorrow. And then there's a picture of the refrigeration truck and that kind of a thing. Here's another thing that I found fascinating. As of this weekend, we, are getting, we began getting reports of Ukrainian refugees coming across the U.S.-Mexico border. Uh, Phil Metzger, who I think was just in that video, was down there with a team today near San Diego ministering to these families. So we've begun establishing a network of resources here in California of Calvary Chapel churches and their partners who would be open to hosting short-term or long-term. That I would never even think about. Oh, yeah, there, some of them are going to come here, and they're coming across the Mexican border. Um, I read, I got an email last night about a Calvary Chapel in Ukraine that is in western Ukraine, so they're not really under attack. Um, it's a church of about 65 people, and uh, they were serving as a, a, a way station for the refugees who were fleeing eastern Ukraine, and all of a sudden that changed. The refugees who were fleeing no longer wanted to keep fleeing. They wanted to stay, and so this Calvary Chapel now uh, let me see if I can just pull it up here real quick. This Calvary Chapel now, it says, John Brown's, ch or Joel Brown's church of 65 members became a refugee center almost overnight when the war began. Like, while most refugees move on to other countries, some are starting to choose to stay and help. In a united effort with other believers in the city, they have now opened five centers, four houses, and a personal dormitory house for single people. As of early April, they have housed and provided for over 6,000 people. And that's what's going on in the Ukraine. So, so that helps us to know what to pray for. If you've seen the updates in the weekly email especially, you know that the prayer needs keep changing. However, today we are announcing that for the entire month of April, we're also going to do uh, a financial collection. And the way it always works here is that you can give right through the offering box. Just make sure that your gifts, whether you're using an envelope or a check or whatever, um, just make sure that it's labeled Ukraine. And we'll make sure it gets to where we're going to be sending all of that once it's all in. So where is that? Well, the people who have been putting these videos together have been doing about two of them a week. And they're all based out of Calvary Chapel, San Diego. The pastor of that church pastored in Hungary for a, for a very long time and still has a lot of connections in Poland. Um, the first Calvary Chapel in Poland got started by a guy who took his family from Indiana and went over, and, excuse me, in the Ukraine, and went over to the Ukraine and planted the first Calvary Chapel. There's now 20 of them. He's, he has passed on, but his three sons are each pastoring a Calvary Chapel in Ukraine, which is kind of cool. And so um, they have all the inroads there. They have all the connections there. And it gives us the, the, the blessing, I think, to be part of a bigger church family of Calvary Chapel, to be able to target and say, okay, we want all of this, to go, this money to go to Calvary Chapel San Diego because they are right on top of what the, the most recent needs are. And so you can give throughout the month of April, right in the offering box, pray about it. Um, and see what the Lord would have you do. You can drop it in the offering box, and at the end of April, we'll get it all to Calvary San Diego for the continued ministry in Ukraine. All right, let's take a moment and stand and uh, have a word of prayer, and then we'll give you the opportunity to greet each other. Heavenly Father, just as we are uh, gathering for worship today, amazingly, even in some of the most war-torn places in the Ukraine, Lord, they are also gathering for worship today, too. 
whether it's an underground tunnel or a bunker or a, a church building that has been shelled out or there in western Ukraine where they're a bit safer. Lord, they're lifting their voices to you today. They're lifting their hearts to you today. And so, Lord, we just appreciate being a part of something bigger than who's here and what's going on here. And Lord, we want to continue to be part of a, 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 a play a bigger part in what you're going to be doing long term over there in the Ukraine. As the one woman in the video said, there's more people who are willing to even have conversations about you. And Lord, we're just going to trust that that's going to lead to many putting their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, we pray that you would just show us as families and then collectively as a church family what you want us to do to assist what's going on over there. For today, Lord, we are here. You are here. There will be no better time spent by us this Sunday than this 90 minutes with you. So, Lord, hear our prayers. Receive our worship. Speak to our hearts as only you can through the power of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Take a minute or two, say hi to some people near you today. Good morning, everyone. Let's worship the Lord together, spend some time in his presence. Give him the praise and glory that's due only his name. Just as you are to worship. 
I have no needs You lead me by peaceful streams And you refresh my life You hold my hand and you guide my steps I could walk through the valley of death And I won't be Because you are in control. Because you are in control. Because you are in Shepherd, I have no needs. You lead me by peaceful streams, and you refresh my life. You hold my hand and you guide my steps. I could walk through the valley of death, and I won't be afraid. Because you
you are in control of all situations, all things in our lives that you know are infinitely Lord. That you are a God who cares about us, who desires a relation, has a relationship with us, Lord. That we can just spend time in your presence and you know who we are intimately. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Jesus, for always hearing our cry, Lord, always being present for us, Father God. Hear our words today, Lord, our worship. In your name we pray. Thank you for this time in your presence, Lord. Thank you and lead us in your ways constantly. And we pray that you would bless Don as he uh, teaches your word this morning. Fill him with your spirit. Use him to minister to our hearts, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Kids, you were dismissed for Calvary Kids this morning. And let's have us big kids who are staying in the room open up our Bibles one last time to the book of Haggai. If you're using a pew Bible and you get to the page, just shout out the page number. That'll be helpful to those of us who are trying to figure out where it is. 839. Page 839. We're going to be in Haggai chapter 2. We're going to pick up with verse 10, scoot right through to the end of the book. We'll be looking at a couple of other passages of Scripture 
as well. But we'll be in Haggai chapter 2. As we've been saying every week by way of introduction, Haggai is a bit of a different uh, book along with Zechariah because... Somebody after the service remind me I set my glasses there because I'll be running around going, where's my glasses? Um, because Haggai and Zechariah come along after a 70-year captivity in the nation of Babylon. So they accompany back a group of people who, if they're elderly, maybe they remember Jerusalem, and some of them did. Maybe they remember the temple, and some of them did. Maybe some of them remember the glory years of the temple, and again, some of them did. But for the most part, the people they lead back have never been to Jerusalem. There's a bunch of uh, people who come back who, you know, 70 years in another country means we haven't seen our hometown. We don't know much about the temple and all of these different things. And so God raises up Haggai and Zechariah almost simultaneously. Their ministries kind of overlap with each other. Haggai talks about the work that they need to do with their hands, while Zechariah spends a lot of time talking about the heart that needs to accompany that work. But even, I think we'll see this morning, sometimes even their messengers, or their messages, I should say, their messages, what they have to say, overlap with each other. So here we go now in Haggai chapter 2. We're going to pick up, as I said, with verse 10. On the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai, and this is what the Lord of armies says, verse, uh, where am I, verse 12, verse 11, ask the priests for a ruling. Let's stop there for a minute. Now, in some ways that's not surprising. It, the, the way that it was structured in the Old Testament, the way that, that they did things is that the priests very often would have a position where uh, they did not just help you with spiritual things, but they also helped you sometimes with business things. And sometimes they helped you with, with you know, more material things than the spiritual things. So here we have some kind of a question that is coming up, and We'll talk about the question in a few minutes. Some kind of question that's coming up that God says, you know, you need to go to the priest to get a ruling on that particular topic. Now, we think, okay, well, that's no big deal, so they go to the priest. But remember what I already said. They haven't been in Jerusalem for 70 years. There hasn't been a temple for 70 years, which means there have not really been active priests for 70 years. So he is now talking to them about something that they are not used to doing. They've spent the last 70 years in Babylon. They didn't go to their priest in Babylon. Or if they did, it wasn't a godly priest. They just went to whoever might give them some advice or some counsel. Maybe it was a best friend. Maybe it was a, you know, an older adult that they respected and, and maybe had mentored them. So this is a very new thing, this concept and this idea of, okay, there's a question about something spiritual, now go to the priest and, and ask about it. Not only would it have been a new thing for the people to get back in the habit of doing this, but it also would have been a new thing for the priests. For 70 years, you haven't had people coming to you saying, listen, I'm really struggling in this area of my life, or I've got a question about God's word, or I'm, I'm trying to figure out God's will for my life. They haven't had as priests, people coming to them to do that for 70 years. So all of this is new, which is why it's great when we get to this question here. It's actually like a softball question, you know? Like it's a really easy question for them to answer. But I wanted us to talk a little bit first this morning about just this whole idea of um, going to the Word of God or going to um, a priest, or the, the way we would put it is, going to a pastor, or even going to another Christian for guidance on spiritual things. So I want you to turn over with me from um, Haggai, just two books of the Bible, and they're not big ones, to Malachi. I want to show you this one verse in Malachi chapter 2, and then we'll jump into a verse in the New Testament. So you're in Haggai, flip a few pages to your right, you'll probably be in Zechariah, and then right after Zechariah, we have... Malachi, or as some prefer to say, the only Italian prophet in the Bible, Malachi, um, 
but that's not how you pronounce his name. But Malachi chapter 2, verse 7 encapsulates for us what God expects of a priest or a pastor or clergy and what God expects of the people. Here's what it says, Malachi chapter 2, verse 7, God says this, For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge and people should desire instruction from his mouth because he is the messenger of the Lord of armies. Twice in there we're told about a group and what they should be doing. First of all, it should be that pastors are guarding knowledge. And we're not just talking about general knowledge, right? When God says, hey, I want you to guard knowledge, what's he talking about? Well, he's talking about the word of God. He's talking about his expectation that pastors should know the word of God. So that if somebody comes to you and, and uh, says to you, you know what, I have a question about something in the Bible, your response isn't, oh, really, so do I. No, a pastor should have a working knowledge of the word of God so that when the people come, he's able to give an educated answer. Does that mean the pastor's always right? No, but is the word of God always right? Yes, it is. And so, you know, spiritual issues need to be handled spiritually. And there's way more spiritual issues today than we think. Most, most times when people are struggling with sin, it's a spiritual issue, but it presents as something else on the surface. Why well, have a rebellious kid? Is that a rebellion issue or is that a sin issue? It's a sin issue, and that makes it a spiritual issue. Well, my spouse and I, we're not really getting along right now. We're arguing over finances or we're arguing over this. Okay, so, so is that just a, a surface level husband and wife issue? No, it's a biblical issue. And the Bible speaks to all of those different things. And that's why he says to the people, look it, when you've got questions about what's going on in your life, it's a good idea to find a pastor to go and talk to. And pastors, it's a good idea to be prepared so that when people come to you, you're able to not share with them your opinion, not what you think, but what the Word of God says. Now, sometimes there's a disconnect there because people tend today not to go to pastors the way that they used to. They used to sometimes I think today they think that, well, the, you know, if I have a question about the church, I'll go to the pastor. Uh, if I have a question about God, I'll go to the pastor. But, but not if I have a question about my marriage but the word of God speaks to it. Not if I have a question about, um, a few weeks ago, one of the guys from the church, uh, he and I were chatting a little bit because he was having a hard time at his job right now. And what are his obligations at work? The Bible speaks to that. What about raising kids? The Bible speaks to that. What about finances? The Bible speaks to that. What about alcohol or some other substance? The Bible speaks to that. So we as Christians don't just come to Christ or come to, come to the words of Christ, come to the word of God when, it's, uh, when we determine it's a spiritual issue. Try going to God with everything. And, and what we'll find is that the word of God speaks to it. So the, the challenge in Malachi chapter 2 verse 7 uh, for someone like me who's, who's a pastor is that I've got to make sure that, that I know the word of God because people aren't coming to get my wisdom. I don't really have very much of it. People, I got some gray hair coming in right here, right? So there's a little bit of wisdom, uh, but not, not compared to what the Word of God has. Uh, at, but at the same time, we as people, and I'm a people, no, I'm not a people, I'm a person before I'm a pastor, uh, we need to be in the habit of going to pastors when we're struggling with things in life, when we're struggling with anything in life. Listen, the worst thing that I could tell you as a pastor is, you know what, that is outside of my purview, um, and, and the Word of God doesn't really speak to that, and so I would recommend you go talk to such and such a person, or I might connect you with somebody else I know who's going through that. Now listen, I am a pastor, but I have pastors that I go to. I have men that I go to when I'm struggling with things, depending on what it is. I'll go to my dad, who's a retired pastor, um, but I also have a Calvary Chapel pastor that I go to when I'm struggling with things in the church and what I should and shouldn't be doing and, and all of those things. And I don't want them giving me their wisdom as much as I care about them. I want them telling me, how does the word of God speak to this? And so um, he, in Malachi 2.7, again, that's what God is challenging us with. 
that clergy should be guarding knowledge and that people should desire instruction from his mouth. Understanding that if what, what the pastor or the priest you go to talk to, if they give you God's word and you disagree with it, you're not disagreeing with the pastor. You're not disagreeing with the priest. You're disagreeing with God. And so let me show you something in the New Testament. It's in, it's in um, where is it? It's in 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2. And I was looking at this verse this week, and I was looking at it for one reason. And then as I was reading it, I was, um, well, I'll just be honest. I was so convicted by it that I, I shared it with the elders, like, oh, look at this. Look at this verse. So I was getting it for one reason, and God's like, oh, I'll give you another reason to look at that verse, Don. Oh, great. So you want to see the verse that God used to beat me up a little bit? Yeah, some of you do, right. Yeah, of course you do. Of course you do, right. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24. And I think this will speak to us on a different level because, listen, I'm the only pastor of this church, but I'm not the only minister in the building. And sometimes, you know, I grew up too where, where sometimes the pastor was called the minister, right? Um, sometimes the, the pastor was called the reverend. That's not good, you know? Um, uh, but the minister. But, but what Ephesians says is that technically speaking, biblically speaking, you and I are all ministers. Now don't go running around introducing yourself as pastor so-and-so or whatever, all right? But you and I are all ministers because minister just means servant. That's all it means. It just means servant. So, so look at with me at, at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24. Here's what it says. The Lord's servant must not quarrel, but must be gentle to everyone, able to teach, and patient. All right, we could stop right there, right? I mean, that, that's convicting by itself, right? I mean, so, so you and I, all of us, whether I'm a pastor or I'm just, you know, part of the congregation as a minister, I must not quarrel, I must be gentle to everyone, I must be able to teach and patient. At least two of those things are hard for me. I don't know about you, right? Patience, sometimes. Uh, when I'm in a doctor's office, I'm, I'm patient, you know, because uh, I am the patient. Um, but, uh, boy, so, some of this stuff is hard, is it not? Uh, must not quarrel. Oh, I have a hard time with that sometimes. Man, I, have, I have like an escalator button, you know, uh, to escalate things sometimes when somebody's arguing with me and when somebody is opposing me rather than being let's just all calm down. No, I'm pressing the button that's like, let's just ramp things up a little bit more, you know? Let's get a little bit redder. Let's get the hit blood pressure going, you know? And all those different things. Uh, when I was younger and I would uh, uh, get mad and I would turn red and I had more hair and it was a bit redder as well, some, uh, one guy here used to call me hotball. <laughs> so uh, he's dead. Um, but, um, but I, I mean, he passed away, not because... You guys are whacked. You, you know what I meant. Uh, the Lord's servant must not quarrel, must be gentle to everyone, able to teach and patient. Now, I love verse 25, and here's why I was initially after it. Verse 24 is just very convicting that if, if we're servants of the Lord, we're not supposed to be escalating things. We're not supposed to be arguing over things. And, and I, Elisa, I don't think she's in the room right now, but but so many of our arguments sometimes are over something that two days later we don't even remember what it was about. I mean, is that petty, right? I mean, that insignificant. And, and we draw a line in the sand over that? And we escalate things over that? Yeah. I'm ashamed of some of the things that we argue about. Must not quarrel, but must be gentle to everyone, able to teach and patient. Now here's verse 25 instructing his opponents with gentleness. Now, I love that because it, 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 it helps me as a pastor to know that sometimes when somebody is coming to talk to me about an issue, in their mind, I'm already their opponent. Do you see that there in verse 25? Instructing his opponents with gentleness. If you're my opponent, we're, we're not on the same side. And so sometimes what happens is I'll have a married couple who comes and meets with me, happened not too long ago for me, where coming into it, the, the, I was, the, the husband kept saying to me, so everything's on the table, right? 
so everything's on the table, right? So everything's on the table, right? And I was like, well, yeah, we can talk about anything. And he unloaded. He absolutely unloaded on his wife. And when I tried to jump in, he unloaded on me. And it was just a very difficult, it was probably the most difficult counseling session that I've ever been a part of in my life. And what I never thought about was that him asking me about it before he walked in to talk to me should have been a tip-off for me that, that he and I were going to be on opposite sides before he even said a word. Because, because what was really going on was he was on the opposite side of God, not on the opposite side of me. He didn't want to hear scripture about loving your wife. He didn't want to hear scripture about the servant of the Lord not being quarrelsome but being gentle. He didn't want to hear any of that. And so it helps me, and maybe it'll help you too, if we understand that sometimes when people come to us as a servant of the Lord to talk about spiritual things, they're already on the opposite side of us. And so if we kind of go in with it, with that mindset, it tells us there in verse 25 that, that then we can instruct them. And we do it gently and we do it patiently, but we show them, we instruct them, we teach them from God's word, instructing his opponents with gentleness. Perhaps God will grant them repentance, leading them to the knowledge of the truth. If they need repentance, it means they were wrong. It means they were in sin. And so not only are they opposed to me because, and I've had it before too where uh, this was years ago, I had a, um, a uh, husband and wife bring one of their uh, teenage daughters to meet with me. And I think the husband and wife walked in thinking that I was going to agree with them on everything. And I agreed with them on almost nothing, which meant that I agreed with their daughter who was just really dealing with some things, and um, it was like, oh my goodness, I can't believe that you would side with her, you know, but, but we used the word of God, and so their argument, again, wasn't, uh, the, the ones who needed to repent were, were the parents, because they were the ones in sin, they were the ones who had done something wrong, not everything wrong, of course, but they had done something wrong. And so that's the idea there. Perhaps God will grant them repentance, leading them to the knowledge of the truth that they may come to their senses and escape the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. So just to kind of wrap that up and, and understand, right, that, that you and I are servants of the Lord. And, and so 2 Timothy 2 verse 24 shares how we should be. And we have to understand that that people are going to oppose us in this world, even other Christians, definitely ones who aren't Christians. So if, you, if they're spouting off about um, uh, some of the social issues today and you come in to that situation as a Christian, make sure you're sharing with them God's word, which means you need to know what God's word says on that particular subject. And then if they still are in disagreement with what you're sharing with them, they're not opposed to you, they're opposed to God because you've brought him into the middle of it. Does that make sense? That you've brought him into the middle of it, you've brought his word into it. You're not saying, well, this is what I say. You're saying, this is what God says. But you better make sure you know what God says, whether you're a pastor or just a servant or, or that kind of a thing. Now, back in Haggai chapter two, let's look at their question. It's a softball one, like I said. It's an easy question, even the... Uh, but there's a specific explanation that he gives with it. Haggai chapter 2, verse 13, or verse 12. It says this, If a man is carrying consecrated meat in the fold of his garment, and it touches bread, stew, wine, oil, or any other food, does it become holy? And the priest answered no. I, the first thing I see when I read that is that's a nice meal right there right? We've got some meat, we've got some potatoes, we've got some stew, we've got, uh, does it mention bread in there? Yeah, uh, bread in there, and then I think where it says, or any other food, that should be translated in the Hebrew, dessert. Uh, and, and then it's all in there, you know? But what a weird question. 
Now that word consecrated there, it just means holy. And if you think of it that way, it's easier uh, for me to explain it and easier for us to understand it. The question is this, if there's a piece of meat that is holy, it's almost comical because it says he's carrying holy meat in the fold of his garment. So if you happen to see me this week and I pull out a burger from my pocket, you know, no, um, no that won't happen. But, but he, he's got this holy meat and the holy meat comes into contact with other things. And so the question is this, does something holy that touches something else make that something else holy? And look at the priest's answer. One word, end of verse 12, no. Holiness doesn't transfer. So, well, let's just leave it at that for now. Holiness doesn't transfer. You can have the holiest thing, and if it comes into contact with, with your shoulder, your shoulder is not now holy, all right? It doesn't work that way. Holiness doesn't transfer. Look at the next question. Another softball question. T change, the, uh, change the scenario a little bit, verse 13. Then Haggai asked, if someone defiled by contact with a corpse touches any of these, does it become defiled? The priest answered, it becomes defiled. Or in other words, they say, yes. Now, for that word defiled, you can use the word unholy. So we have something that's holy that comes into contact with something in my life. Is my life now holy? No. If it comes into contact with my wife, is my wife now holy? No. Not from that, because holiness doesn't transfer. However, if, and don't try this at home this week, if you're hanging around some, you know, a dead body this week, all right, and you become unclean because of that, and then you touch something else, you just made them unclean. Holiness doesn't transfer, but unholiness does, or uncleanness does. We could take two kids, and I so wanted to, try this for real in front of us, but I didn't. Um, you could take two kids and cover one of them with mud and have the other one just be spick and span clean. And you could tell the kid who was clean, I want you to clean the, the kid covered head to toe in mud. And he might try or she might try as well as they possibly could, but when all is said and done, maybe that kid who was covered with mud would, would be a little bit cleaner Maybe, but I can guarantee you this, the kid who was clean now has mud all over him too. And that's the way, it, that's what this is talking about. Cleanness, holiness doesn't transfer, but unholiness does. So, so now we have to ask a question of our own. Why in the world is God having them go to the priests to get God's answer about these questions. We understand this is God's answer. This isn't the priests putting their heads together and contemplating. They don't even need to spend a lot of time in prayer to come up with ans the, the answer that, that holiness doesn't transfer, but unholiness certainly does. Um, good conduct corrupts. Uh, no, that's the other way around. <laughs> wow, I just told you the opposite of it, yeah. Bad conduct corrupts, no. What is it again? What is it? Bad conduct corrupts good morals. That's from the Bible. Yeah, see? So she used script. So I can't say, well, I don't agree with that, because then I'm not agreeing with God. It has nothing to do with it, whether I agree with Nancy or not. I don't agree with Nancy. She's married to a Miami Dolphins fan, but that's a completely different, you know, topic of conversation. Mike and I talked about it a little bit before church, so... Um, anyway, so bad company corrupts good morals. So, so why does he send them to ask these questions about whether holiness can transfer and unholiness can transfer? He tells us himself in verse 14, then Haggai replied, so is this people and so is this nation before me. Remember, he's speaking for the Lord. This is the Lord's declaration and so is every work of their hands even what they offer there is defiled. Wow. What's he saying? Well, hey, you guys who have gotten together now and are getting ready to, to build the temple, to lay that cornerstone, and to see it through to the capstone, 
You're in the holy land, Israel. You're in the holy city, Jerusalem. You're building the holy temple, and you're doing it with your hands. In other words, you're, you're kind of getting into it, and, and you realize who you're doing it for. So you're, you're even doing a holy work with your hands. But none of that matters if your heart is dirty. That's what he's saying to them. Hey, you can be in the holy land, in the holy city, in the holy temple, Listen, you could be in this building with your holy Bible open. And if your heart is dirty, it affects everything else. Well, well, isn't my heart clean because I go to church? No. Well, isn't my heart clean because I, 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 I sang some worship songs with Tom and Lisey this morning? No. Isn't my heart clean because I have a Bible open? Nope. Our heart can only be cleansed by the Lord. We can have all kinds of holy-looking things happening on the outside in holy-looking places and holy-looking endeavors. And God says, listen, holiness doesn't transfer. Unholiness does. And if your heart is impure or dirty or unclean or unholy, then every holy thing you think you're doing, you're actually polluting. That's what he says to them. Because it isn't just about what they're doing with their hands. It's about what they're doing with their hearts. And again, like I said before, Haggai talks so much about the hands, and, and they get all wound up about the work, the work, the work. And some people just love the work. Some people just thrive on, on the work, and the, they're doers. You know the people I'm talking about. They're do You could ask them to do anything, and they're going to do it. They're doers. Their hearts are a wreck. I mean, their hearts are just a mess. And God is trying to prevent them from falling into that trap that really so many people still fall in today, that if I do enough good things, it doesn't matter what's happening in my heart. God says that's not true at all. Because the good things that you're doing or thinking you're doing, if your heart is impure, those good, you're just dirtying those things. It may still look nice, may still look good. People may still pat you on the back and say, oh, we knew we could count on you. You're such a doer. But it doesn't amount to anything of value in the eyes of the Lord. And that's what he's warning them. They, they, listen, he's telling them this even before they've built anything. This isn't like, oh, it's all done, and he tells them this. No, he warns them ahead of time. Now, you and I may not be building anything right now, so for us, maybe, maybe the warning is coming after the fact, but it still is good that God's, God's word is warning us about this. Because I don't know about you, I don't want to do good things and have God say, yeah, but Don, your heart was such a mess when you did that. Those don't count for anything. I, I don't want to hear that. And so God is warning us here in Haggai chapter 2 about making sure that it's not just about our hands and it's also, that it's also about our hearts. And so he says this to them then in verse 15. He says this, Now from this day on, think carefully. Before one stone was placed on another in the Lord's temple, before you even started the building project, he wants them to think about something. Verse 16. What state were you in? Here's what he means. He continues on. When someone came to a grain heap of 20 measures, it only amounted to 10. When one came to the wine press to dip 50 measures from the vat, it only amounted to 20. I struck you all the work of your hands with blight, mildew, and hail, but you didn't turn to me. This is the Lord's declaration. Hey, what had their hearts not done? Turn to the Lord. What, what had their hands begun to do? Build the temple. And they were willing to ignore what was going on in their hearts because of the good thing that they were doing with their hands. And God says, no, 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 no. Not so fast. I'm not interested in the good work of your hands if your hearts have not turned to me. And he says to them, he's going to say it ultimately three times just in this end, the end of the second chapter. He says to them, think carefully. He wants them to think about, and, and he says to them, when, when, when you went to start this project, where were you at? When he says what state, he's not like, were you in Florida or New Hampshire, all right? He, what state, what was going on in your life? 
Let's remind ourselves. Look back with me at chapter 1 of Haggai at verse 5. 1 5. Now the Lord of armies says this, and here's the phrase again think carefully about your ways. You planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough to be satisfied. You drink, but never have enough to be happy. You put on clothes, but never have enough to get warm. The wage earner puts his wages into a bag with a hole in it. The Lord of armies says this, think carefully about your ways. That's what he wants them to think about. What what state were you in before you even started this project? Think about what your life looked like. He says in there that that their grain production had dropped 50%. The production of of wine or grape juice or grape products had dropped 60%. That's in chapter 2. And in chapter 1, he's saying you were never hungry, excuse me, you were never satisfied, you were always thirsty, you were never warm, you never had enough, never had enough, never had enough. I want you to think about being in that state because that's the state you were in before you started working with your hands and before your hearts turn to me. So think carefully, he says. Think carefully. Then he tells them in verse, uh, uh, notice verse 17 with me for a second. Look at everything God does there. He says, I struck you. God struck the work of their hands with blight, mildew, and hail, but you didn't turn to me. This is the Lord's declaration. God is not above tearing things out of our life that we're doing only with our hands and not our hearts if that's what it will take to get our hearts to turn to him i can't believe this is falling apart in my life well had you ever given it to the lord no no i'd I'd never given it to the lord so you were just doing it that was the work of your hands but not your heart well maybe god is letting it fall apart so that you'll turn your heart to him that's what god is saying there Here we go, verse 13. Here's the phrase again. From this day on, think carefully. From the 24th day of the ninth month, from the day the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, think carefully. Is there seed, is there still seed left in the granary? The vine, the fig, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have not yet produced, but from this day on, I will bless you. Why, was it some kind of a special holiday? No, but God meant for it to be some kind of a special holy day. He meant for it to to be that for that date, the 24th day of the month, he meant for that day to be the day that they didn't just give God the work of their hands, but the work of their hearts. That they didn't just say, Lord, bless what I'm doing with my hands, but Lord, first, bless my heart, touch my heart change my heart do in my heart whatever needs to be done because i don't want what i'm doing here or where i'm going with my feet or what i'm saying with my words to amount to nothing because my heart has not turned to you first so he says to them think carefully sometimes it's hard to think carefully i'm going to cut in front of you for one second here sometimes it's hard to think carefully when um when there's a lot going on around us right whoops turn my flashlight on there it's hard to think carefully when there's a lot going on around us so think in in other words sometimes it's hard to think carefully to really ponder things when when other people are around us I, i it's hard at church sometimes to know okay, uh, I I really need to think more about this, but there's music playing and there's people milling around and and there's nothing wrong with those things. And so I don't think by think carefully, he means like, right now, hurry up, think carefully. No, I don't think he means that at all. That there's a place for us to take the scripture that God feeds us at church, feeds us at women's Bible study, feeds us in youth group or or kayak or any other setting. There's There's a time and a place to take that and kind of go over it again, to kind of think carefully about it and, and consider it and think about, okay, Lord, what is this saying, not just in general, but what is this saying to me? It's a young woman from the church um, who texted me this week, and it blessed me um, to, to hear how the Lord was working in her life, so I just wanted to share it 
with you. She said this. She said, good afternoon, Pastor Don. I hope you're doing well. I was just thinking about the sermon on Sunday. Think carefully. God's word. And how you know you said, and how you know, how you were doing, you said maybe twice or three times that God always provides for us, for our financial needs and everything else. I was thinking about it today and yesterday and Monday, and I never really thought about, you know, like there are days when I start becoming frantic because I don't think I'm going to be able to pay a certain bill, and then all of a sudden I sell something. Um, or all right, all right, something that I've made has sold, um, or there's a bill that comes, or my daughter's tuition, and it always seems to happen on the day that it's due. And so I just don't know. I just wanted to express how deep that message was for me on Sunday and to thank you for making me actually think about it. That blessed me, because she wasn't thinking about what I said. She was thinking about what God had said. And she was thinking carefully and therefore was able to apply it to her own life. God showed her, hey, this is, this is how this works out for you. It wasn't, it, was, it wasn't a deep philosophical message. It was just God's word. And as she thought carefully about it, God brought those things to mind. So think carefully. Sometimes when we think carefully, we have to remember the way things were before our hearts turned to God. Sometimes when we think carefully, we have to think carefully about how it is that God is, is blessing us as our hearts turn to him and then the work of our hands. And there may not have been a man in Haggai's day who needed to hear the words of Haggai more than a man by the name of Zerubbabel. Because while he had come back as a leader, a political leader who loved the Lord, to help to lead this, this band of people, and, and it was only about 50,000 of them who came back from Babylon in this wave, to rebuild the temple. That's his responsibility. He really seemed to struggle with some things personally. And I say that not because Haggai has a lot to say to him, but Zechariah sure does. It's to Zechariah that God says, listen, I want you to go and tell Zerubbabel that it will be his hands that start the project and his hands that finish the project. That's encouraging to Zerubbabel if he's, if he's struggling. Like, are we going to make it? Am I going to make it through? I, I'm their governor now, but what if they vote, vote me out? And what about this and what about that? It's the same one that God sends uh, Zechariah to to say, not by power nor by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And that's what leads me to believe that Zerubbabel, even as a leader, struggles, was struggling. And that's okay to admit, if you're a leader, that you're struggling. And so, so those special words came just for Zerubbabel. And here's another one at the end of Haggai. Read with me in verse 20. It says, the word of the Lord came to Haggai a second time on the 24th day of the month. So the same day, as everybody is encouraged to make sure their hearts are turning to the Lord before their hands do the work. That same day, here's what it said, verse 21, speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth. I will overturn royal thrones and destroy the power of the Gentile kingdoms. I will overturn chariots and their riders, horses and their riders will fall, each by his brother's sword. On that day, this is the declaration of the Lord of armies, I will take you, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, my servant, this is the Lord's declaration, and make you like my signet ring, for I have chosen you. This is the declaration of the Lord of armies. Does that mean God hadn't chosen anybody else? Nope. It just means that Zerubbabel on that day especially needed to hear that from the Lord. Zerubbabel, you're the one I've chosen. And sometimes that happens even in church where we can be talking about something from God's word and we, we may even have that thought like, well, that doesn't, really, that doesn't really speak to my heart. But the person right behind you may be thinking, oh my goodness, does that ever speak to my heart? And so we can't be like, oh, what, what, what did I get out? It's just like we're just putting God's word out there and, and whether you're Zerubbabel and really needed to hear it today or you're Haggai or somebody else and it didn't really apply to you in that moment, it can still mean something. 
And he tells Zerubbabel, you see it there for yourself in the last verse, that he's going to make him like his signet ring. If you just drop the ET from the word signet, you get the meaning or the idea behind the signet ring. The signet ring was the ring that would be used to sign something. And, 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 and if you signed it with that ring, you were signing it under the authority of that person or as a representative of that person. And so what God is saying to Zerubbabel is this, Zerubbabel, I didn't just choose you, I chose you to be my sign. A, a sign for what? Well, I think that Zerubbabel is perfectly positioned as a leader, as the governor, as the one who God has chosen to either be encouraging to those around him or discouraging to those around him. The whole group of workers has just been told, listen, your hands are ready to work, but what about your heart? And some of them can think, oh man, we haven't even started and already somebody's discouraging us. No, 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 that's meant to be encouraging. And you have Zerubbabel, who himself is struggling with some things. Who needs to be told, your hands are going to finish the work. Who needs to be told, not by power nor by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Who needs to be told, don't despise the day of small things. Zerubbabel had to be told all of those things just in Zechariah chapter 4 alone. Because they were struggles for him. And now he's being told, I haven't just chosen you, but Zerubbabel, you're a sign for me. You, you have influence over the people around you to either be an encourager or to be a discourager. You and I have been chosen by God. Our name isn't Zerubbabel, but the Bible is clear. You and I have been chosen by God. We may not be governors, we not, may not be pastors, but we've been chosen by God. And I would suggest to you today that you and I are a sign to those around us of what God is like. We, we should be well representing the Lord. Um, Paul tells uh, it's the church in Corinth, right? He tells the church in Corinth, um, uh, he talks to them about being an ambassador for Christ. An ambassador doesn't speak for himself, he speaks for the kingdom he belongs to. He represents the kingdom that he belongs to. He, he is a sign for the king and the kingdom that he belongs to. And the same is true for us as believers. Where you work, where you go to school, where you live, you are positioned, you are placed there by the Lord, chosen, but also positioned either to be an encourager or to be a discourager. You're, you're positioned there to, to help your family, your friends, your classmates, strangers, even enemies, co-workers, to, to it be an encouragement to them or to be a discouragement to them. Now we know what God wants us to be. He wants to be, us to be encouragers. He doesn't want us to be the kind of people who if somebody comes to us and says, man, I really can't do this, to have us say to them, you're right, you can't, you idiot, you know? But that's not encouraging. That's very discouraging. And there's enough of those people in this world already, is there not? There's enough people in those worlds. There's enough Eeyores already, all right? There's enough, oh, Eeyore, you've got a tail. Oh, it's not much of a tail. Oh, Eeyore, man, that's a great house you built. Oh, it's not much of a house. My word. That has a way of being contagious, does it not? Discouragement. We need more Tigger's, right? We need more of the wonderful things about Tigger that Tigger's a wonderful thing, right? We need more of that. We need more of the bouncy and all of that. Not like, not like here's the problem with Tigger, though. He wasn't realistic either, right? He wasn't realistic. He, everything was a party to him and bouncing no matter what was going on. So that's not realistic either. But I'm just trying to say, I'm just trying to put it in a different way that you and I need to be encouragers where we are, where God has us, because we're chosen by him. And there's enough people around who, who are discouragers. Haggai bumped into them. Zerubbabel bumped into them. Zechariah bumped into them. Nehemiah bumped into them, Ezra bumped into them. What do the, all those guys have in common? They all came back to rebuild something in Jerusalem. Some of them the temple, some of them the walls, some of them the houses, and they bumped into discouragement, discouragement, discouragement. And it was hard for them to fight through that. Turn with me for a second to Nehemiah chapter 6. If you open up to the center of your Bibles, you're going to find yourself in the book of Psalms. Right before Psalms, you have Job, and then right before Job, you're going to find Esther and Nehemiah 
and Ezra. Nehemiah is in between the two E's. I want to just show you a couple things here in Nehemiah chapter 6. It is warm in here today, man. Woo. It is, I'm not trying to discourage anyone. I'm just making a statement that it's warm. So. Nehemiah chapter 6. I just want you to notice a few ways that, that they try to discourage um, Nehemiah because, um, well, because the enemy hasn't changed his tactics. That's why, all right? And so, for example, in uh, Nehemiah, uh, what, what chapter did I tell you to turn to? Okay, it's not six. It's four. Um, oh, yeah, actually, no, it is six. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Oh, yeah, like four and six are far apart, right? I have to turn a page. No, you, you'll survive. It's all right, just turn the page. In, in um, Nehemiah uh, chapter 6, verse 1, that's the first one. Look what it says there. It says, uh, when Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall and that no gap was left in it, though at that time I had not installed the doors in the city gates, Sanballat and Geshem uh, sent me a message, come, let's meet together in the villages of the Ono Valley. They were planning to harm me, so I sent messengers to them saying, I'm doing important work, because he was, he was doing the Lord's work. I'm doing important work and cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? Four times they sent me the same proposal, and I gave them the same reply. The first way that they're trying to discourage Nehemiah is to get him to believe that they have something more important for him to do than what God has for them to do. And the enemy still does that today. Hey, you're doing that? Well, hey, don't you think this is more important? Uh, uh, don't, don't you think you should be spending more time on this and less time on that? And when we're doing the work of the Lord and our hearts are in it and, and connected to him and our hands are in it, it can be discouraging when somebody comes along or when the enemy comes along, no matter what that enemy's name is or who is sending them. And when they say to us, well, you, do you really think that's important? Why don't you come do this? Why don't you come do this? Why don't you, why don't you come and see the persistence? Why don't you come do this? Four times, why don't you come do this? Over and over again. Just really trying to get in there like, Nehemiah, you, you can, that's not important. That's not as, as important as coming and talking to us. And that's discouraging when somebody comes alongside you and says, hey, what you're doing isn't important. That's so discouraging. The second thing we see is in the same uh, chapter, chapter 6, uh, verse 2, we already looked at, chapter 6, verse 5, when he will not come to them, they now, in chapter 6, verse 5, it says there that they, um, Sanballat sent me the same message a fifth time by his, sign, uh, by his aide who had an open letter in his hand. You know what that means? Anyone could read it. Anyone could read that letter. And I won't get into what the letter said, but the letter was filled with gossip. The letter was making accusations against Nehemiah and the other workers, but especially Nehemiah, that weren't even true. But it was an open letter. So, so rather than coming to Nehemiah himself, they just started spreading rumors, they started spreading gossip, and they did it in writing. Today, it just happens much quicker than sending a letter. It's a few texts to a few friends, or it's a post on Facebook, or a tweet on Twitter, or a whatever else that would be. And, and all of a sudden, you're, you're, you're spreading false rumors and gossip. You know what? That is so discouraging when gossip is out there about you. It's so discouraging when false rumors are out there about you. It's, it's one of the ways that the enemy discourages. Same chapter now, we looked at verse 1, and we looked at uh, verse 5. Look at, um, I think it's verse 6. Um, yeah, verse 6, or maybe a little further. It says, uh, let's see, here, 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 drop, no, nope, keep going, drop down. Uh, the rumors, you see the rumors spreading in verse 8. Uh, oh, here it is, here it is. It's all the way down in verse 10. Nehemiah, it says in verse 10, I went to the house of Shemaiah, son of Delaiah, son of Mahadabael, who was restricted to his house. He said, let's meet at the house of God inside the temple. Sounds like a good idea, let's go to church. Let's shut the temple doors because they're coming to kill you. They're coming to kill you tonight. But I said, should a man like me run away? How can someone like me enter the temple and live? I, I will not go. So, so here's what's happening. Nehemiah goes to this guy's house because, because this guy is his friend. 
he's getting friendly advice. And the friendly advice that he's getting is, Nehemiah, you should just run. How discouraging is that? You're giving your time, your energy, your effort to the work. You're, you've given your heart to the Lord. And someone who is supposedly your friend is offering you the friendly advice that, you know what, you should just leave. Just, I mean, you're going to wind up getting hurt. They're coming to get you. You should just leave and, and just walk away from it all. Just give up on, on what it is that God is having you do. Man, that's discouraging. When you know you're doing what God would have you be doing, and you're putting your hands to it, and you're giving your heart to it, for somebody else to come along and say, you know, you should just walk away. Just give up. It's not, it's not worth it. Wow. What a difficult thing. So one more passage here in... Uh, in Nehemiah, and then we'll look at how he responds um, every single, actually, we can look at that now, how he responds every single time, chapter 6, verse 9, or a good response, I'll put it that way, a good response, chapter 6, verse 9. He picks up on this, for, now, uh, for they were all trying to intimidate us, saying they'll drop their hands from the work and it will never be finished. There's the discouragement. But look at the end of verse 9. But now, my God, strengthen my hands. That's a prayer that Nehemiah prayed. It's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven words in it. But now, my God, strengthen my hands. What a great thing to pray when we're discouraged, isn't it? When someone would have us believe that what we're doing for the Lord is not important. Lord, I'm so discouraged, but now, God, strengthen my hands. When somebody who's coming and, and spreading rumors about you and starting gossip about you, and, and that, oh Lord, that is just so discouraging, but now God, strengthen my hands. When somebody who's your friend says, you know, have you ever thought about just quitting? <laughs> I mean, just quit. I mean, I know you think this is what God would ha be having you do, but if God was having you do this, would there be so much difficulty? Would there be so much opposition? And by the way, yes. <laughs> but why not just quit and walk away from it all? That's so discouraging. Your life's work, your life's ministry, what you believe God is calling you to do, whatever it may be, just quit, just walk away. That's discouraging. But now, oh Lord, strengthen my hands. And then this realization by Nehemiah late in the chapter, Nehemiah chapter 6. Verse It's not in here. Mm -hmm. Just talk amongst yourselves. Oh, here we go. Verse 16. When all our enemies heard this, because they completed it, they completed the wall, all the surrounding nations were intimidated and lost their confidence. I love this last phrase. For they realized that this task had been accomplished by our God. O oh Lord, strengthen my hands. But you, O oh Lord, please strengthen my hands. Not so I can get the work done, but so that you can finish the work through me. Two wonderful things to hold on to any time we are discouraged. O oh Lord, strengthen my hands. And you, Lord, finish the work that you've started through me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the power of your word. I ask you, Lord, that you would help us today to think carefully about it. That doesn't mean right here, right now. It just means at some point, Lord, that maybe we open up our Bibles back at home, pull our phones back out and flip in them back to Haggai chapter 2 or to 2 Timothy 2 or Nehemiah 6, wherever you may lead us, and think what you have to say to us. Because, Lord, your word always speaks Maybe, Lord, for some of us, it's just to be encouragers, like we talked about near the end. Maybe for some of us, Lord, it's, it's to be better servants of the Lord, servants of you. To be less of the escalator, less divisive, less petty over argumentative things. Gentler with those who oppose us. Understanding that when we bring your word into the situation, if there is still opposition, it is not to us, but to your word, to you. Maybe, Lord, for some of us, it's we've been working so hard with our hands. 
There are so many people, Lord, in our church who do so many things behind the scenes that we don't even see from straightening out the Bibles and, and taking care of calendars and leading different ministries, uh, sweeping the floor after a mess or, or whatever it may be, Lord. That's our hands. But maybe today, Lord, we need to think carefully about where our hearts are in all of that. We don't want what we do with our hands or where we go with our feet that we believe to be for you to all be for nothing. But that's exactly what it is. If the uncleanness of our hearts is not dealt with, it transfers to the clean things that we're trying to do. So give us that place, Lord, to pause, to think carefully at some point in these next few days. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. After we sing the closing song, just two quick reminders. One is that Will and Paula, who greeted you on your way in today, will be at the front for anyone who needs prayer for anything at all. And also there's cards in the Welcome Center for the college students. Please take a minute just to slap your signature and maybe a note on there as well. Let's stand as we sing with Tom and Lisa. all sin and worship together.
praise you, that you are the lover of our souls, Lord, and that you desire to use us and to, uh, to see only the best in our lives, Lord. Thank you for your message this morning. Just let it fill our hearts this week and let us uh, serve you each and every day this week, Lord, and tell others about you and just be glad in all that you've done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>